Hi everyone, it's Aleem here. In this video, we're going to be learning about accounting for accounts receivable. First of all, we've got to answer the question, what are receivables and how are they reported on the balance sheet? An introduction. Receivables defined. A receivable arises when a business or person sells goods or services to another party on credit. A receivable also arises when one person lends money to another. Each credit transaction involves two parties. You have the creditor, who sells something and obtains a receivable, which is an asset, and the debtor, who makes the purchase and has a payable, which is a liability. Three types of receivables are accounts receivable, which are amounts to be collected from customers, notes receivable, a more formal receivable that includes a written promise to pay at a specific date, and other receivables, a miscellaneous category that may include loans to employees or even amounts due from the government. Accounts receivable is created when a business sells goods or services on credit and is listed on the balance sheet as a current asset. Notes receivable due within a year or one operating cycle are also listed as current assets. Other receivables are usually long-term, but they are considered current assets if they are due within a year. The Collection of Receivables and the Credit Department Companies grant credit to customers in order to increase sales. The credit department evaluates customers who apply to purchase goods or services on account. Accounting for bad debts. Selling on credit provides both a benefit and a cost. The benefit is selling to a wider range of customers, including those who may or may not have had cash with them at the time. But the cost is that some of those customers may be unable to pay or you will be unable to collect from them at some point in the future. Uncollectible accounts create a cost or expense, which we typically call the bad debt expense. It also has other names. You might hear about it called the uncollectible account expense or doubtful account expense. But for now, remember bad debt expense. Bad debt expense is an operating expense. There is no one indicator that an account has become delinquent and will not be paid. But you could look for clues, and some of them would be 1. The receivable is past due. 2. The customer does not respond to company calls or attempts to collect. The company has filed for bankruptcy or has closed. Or the customer cannot be located. The second learning objective in this chapter is to use the allowance method to account for uncollectibles and estimate uncollectibles by the percentage of sales, aging of AR, and the percent of AR methods. Let's talk about the allowance method. The allowance method records uncollectible amounts based on estimates developed from past experience. Bad debt expense is matched in the same period as the sales revenue, so we call this matching. A contra account to AR is set up called the allowance for doubtful accounts, and the allowance for doubtful accounts is the amount of receivables that the business expects to not collect. See, one of the challenges when we sell on credit is that you don't know when or who is not going to pay you back. You just know that on average, typically, some of your customers may not pay you back. Now, because that's a cost of selling on credit, we need to record that expense in the period we make the sale. To do that, we have to make an estimate for what we expect not to collect. The allowance is subtracted from AR, and a net amount is determined as shown in this partial balance sheet. So in this example here, we have accounts receivable of $10,000. Customers owe this amount. We subtract the allowance for doubtful accounts. That's the amount you expect not to collect. And this leaves you with net AR, which in this case is $9,100, and this is what we expect to get paid. Now, how do you estimate uncollectibles? One, you could use percentage of sales, and that's an income statement approach. And then there are two balance sheet approaches. One is called the aging of AR method, and the other is called the percentage of AR method. All three approaches work under the allowance method, and all three are going to require an adjusting entry at the end of the period. Let's start with the easiest of the three, which is the percentage of sales method. Under this method, we're going to compute the bad debt expense as simply a percentage of net credit sales. It's also called the income statement approach because it's focusing on the amount of the expense. It ignores the current balance of the allowance account, and typically it's based on prior experience of the business. To do this, we use our prior experience and we come up with a factor or some percentage of credit sales that we expect to be uncollectible. In this example, the business expects 2% of net credit sales to be uncollectible, and credit sales were $500,000. Well, $500,000 times 2% 
gives you $10,000. So in this particular instance, we'd record a bad debt expense of $10,000 and increase our allowance for doubtful accounts, which has a normal credit balance, by $10,000. The effect of this adjusting entry will be to decrease net income and decrease net accounts receivable. If we look at this example here, had we started with $100,000 in AR and our allowance now was increased by $10,000, if, for example, we already had a balance of $1,000 in the allowance for doubtful accounts, this would now give us a balance of $11,000 in the allowance for doubtful accounts, and net AR would be $89,000. In the aging of AR method, we're going to assume that the older the AR, the less likely we are to collect it. This method is also called the balance sheet approach because it focuses on AR. Step 1. We're going to group accounts based on how much time has passed since they were created. We'll estimate the rates of uncollectability for each group, and apply that rate to each group to get the required balance for the allowance account. So here's an example. Bicycle Company has the following schedule of accounts receivable by age. We have $37,000 as current, $6,500 as 1 to 30 days old, $3,500 between 31 and 60 days old, $1,900 between 61 and 90 days old, and finally $1,000 that are over 90 days old. Step 1 is we're going to look at the percentages and assign them to each of the categories. You'll notice we assign a larger percentage to the older accounts because they are less likely to be collected. Step 2 is we multiply the amount in the, the balance by that percentage to come up with the amount we believe to be uncollectible, and finally, step three, we add it all up to find out the amount we expect not to collect. So here what we're saying is out of $49,900, we estimate that $2,290 will be uncollectible. We don't know which customers won't pay us, but our estimate is that if we are owed almost $50,000 there, we probably won't collect around $2,200. So, customers owe the company for $49,900, but the company expects not to collect 2290 of the amount, and the balance in the allowance account therefore needs to be 2290. How do we get that to happen? Well, let's say our unadjusted balance was $200 on the debit side. To get from a debit balance of $200 to a credit balance, which is what we need, of 2290, we actually need to credit the allowance for doubtful accounts account by $2,490. And as a result, the bad debt expense we need to record is $2,490. By posting that adjusting entry, we allow the net receivable amount to reflect the amount the company expects to collect. So the net realizable value in this instance is $49,900 minus the $2,290 in the allowance for doubtful accounts, which gives you $47,610. Another balance sheet approach is called the percentage of accounts receivable method. In this method, we're going to take a percentage of the total amount of AR. So assume that we've got $100,000 that we are owed, and 5% of that is estimated to be uncollectible. Let's assume the allowance is already $1,000 in the credit position before adjustment. Therefore, to get a balance of $5,000 as a credit balance, we need to adjust it or increase it by $4,000. Here we need a credit of $4,000, and to do that, we're going to debit the bad debt expense and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts by $4,000. To summarize, in the income statement approach, which is the percentage of sales method, we adjust the allowance for doubtful accounts by the amount of the bad debt expense. We start by calculating the bad debt expense, and then we use that to adjust the allowance for doubtful accounts. In the balance sheet approaches, we want to know what the allowance for doubtful accounts should be, and we adjust it to the amount we expect to be uncollectible. As a result, the bad debt expense is simply plugged by figuring out the amount we expect is uncollectible and working backwards to get the bad debt expense. So how do write-offs work? To write off an uncollectible account, when the credit department determines that an account is deemed uncollectible, it must be written off. Assume on March 31st, $1,200 from customers Augur and Kirsch are deemed uncollectible. The entry would be to debit the allowance for doubtful accounts for $1,200 and credit the AR for Augur and AR for Kirsch subledger accounts. Since the allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra-asset account, the write-off of uncollectible accounts has no effect on total assets, it has no effect on total liabilities, it has no effect on equity.
Now what happens, let's say months later, that the company receives a $900 check from Augur that was previously written off? Think about this for a second. You receive the cash for $900, so you'd like to debit cash, but what would you credit? There is no AR to match that with. So as a result, what we need to do is two things. One, we need to reverse the original write-off. We'll debit AR, Augur, for 900 and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts to reinstate that customer's account. Second, we'll debit cash and credit AR for the $900 to record the collection on account. Please note, I recognize that we're going to get two accounts there that cancel each other out, but you still need to post this as two separate journal entries. Let's practice. On October 29th, 2021, TC Company concluded that a customer's $4,400 AR was uncollectible and that the account should be written off. What effect will this write-off have on TC's 2021 net income and balance sheet totals, assuming that the allowance method is used to account for bad debts? A. Decrease in net income, no effect on total assets. B. No effect on net income or on total assets. C. Decrease in net income, decrease in total assets. D. Increase in net income, no effect on total assets. Or finally, E. No effect on net income, but a decrease in total assets. You can pause the video here if you'd like. Think about it for a second. Welcome back. The answer is B. There is no effect on net income or on total assets. To write off the account, we're going to debit the allowance for doubtful accounts and credit AR, meaning that those two cancel each other out and there is no impact to total assets. And since neither of those are income statement accounts, there is no effect to net income either. Let's talk about accounting for notes receivable, including what are notes receivable and how to account for them. An overview. A promissory note is a written promise to pay a specified sum of money at a particular future date. A note receivable may arise from a sale or can even be given in settlement of an existing AR. The maker of the note pays the payee the maturity value, and the maturity value includes principal plus interest. Here's what a note looks like. You have the amount, which in this case is $1,000, the date that it was set up, which was September 30th, 2016 in this instance. You've got the principal amount, which is $1,000. The interest rate is 6%. The interest rate, by the way, is always stated as an annual rate of interest, and in this case, this note will accrue interest between September 30th, 2016 and September 30th, 2017. To calculate the interest on the note, we'll take the principal of $1,000, multiply it by the interest rate of 6%, times one year, or fraction of a year if that's the case, and in this case we get $60. So on September 30th, when the note was issued, we'll debit note receivable, L. Holland, right, we'll put the person's name there, $1,000, and we'll credit cash for $1,000. When we collect the note on September 30th, 2017, we'll debit cash, we'll credit note receivable for $1,000, and finally we'll credit interest revenue for $60. If the note was issued relating to a sale, we'll debit notes receivable and credit service revenue. What if the note was issued relating to settlement of AR? We'll debit notes receivable and credit accounts receivable. When payment is received, interest is recorded in the same manner as the example of a note issued for cash. Accruing interest revenue. If a note's receivable is outstanding at the end of the accounting period, the interest earned on the note up to the year end must be accrued. For a 12 month, 9% interest, $6,000 note, issued on October 1st, 2017, with a December 31st, 2017 year end, the adjusting entry would be $6,000 times 9%, times, let's see, October, November, December, that's three months out of 12, that gives you $135, we'll increase interest receivable by debiting it, so debit interest receivable, we'll increase interest revenue by crediting it, credit interest revenue for $135. Now, on September 30th, 2018, when the note becomes due, we'll debit cash for $6,540, now that includes $6,000 for the note that was due, the $135 we already accrued, and then the remaining interest that accrues from the end of the year, December 31st, and when the note was collected, which is September 30th. That's another nine months out of 12, or $405.
a dishonored note. If the maker of a note does not pay the note receivable at maturity, the maker is said to dishonor or default on the note. The payee still has a claim against the note's maker and transfers the amount, both the principal and the interest in this case, to AR. Suppose that on February 3rd, a six-month, 10% note receivable for $5,000 is dishonored. Here we're going to debit AR for Northern Cabinets for $5,250. We credit the notes receivable account for $5,000, and we credit interest revenue for $250. That's the amount of interest that was earned, $5,000 times 10% times 6 over 12. How does all of this show up on the balance sheet? For companies reporting under ASPE, Accounting Standards for Private Enterprises, it is not necessary to present the allowance for doubtful accounts in the financial statements. Companies can use a note to the financial statements to give more detail if they need to. Okay, let's talk about evaluating how effectively a company collects its AR. The balance sheet lists assets in their relative order of liquidity. Typically, we start with cash, which is the most liquid asset, then short-term investments, then current receivables, then merchandise inventory. One measure is the acid test ratio or quick ratio, and this measures liquidity, and it's a more stringent me measure of the ability to pay current liabilities as compared to the current ratio. Remember, the current ratio was simply our current assets divided by our current liabilities, and it tells us whether or not the entity can pay all of its current liabilities if they become due immediately. Just like the current ratio, the higher the ratio, the better the ability to pay its current liabilities. To calculate the acid test ratio, we only look at the highly liquid accounts, which in this case includes cash, short-term investments, and net current receivables, and we divide that by total current liabilities. Finally, we've got the days, sales, and receivables, which is a measure of how many days it takes to collect the average level of AR. The shorter the collection period, the quicker we're collecting AR. To calculate this, first we have to calculate something called the AR turnover ratio, which is our net credit sales divided by the average amount of gross AR, and the average amount of gross AR is our beginning AR plus our ending AR, all divided by 2. This gives us a turnover ratio, and when divided into 365, we get a measure for how many days, on average, it takes us to collect the average amount of AR. Now one last note here is we should compare that to our credit terms to establish whether or not we're doing a good job or a poor job of collecting AR.